Such a pleasure to have Vern Arnish on this episode today. He's a true legend. Uh, Vern is going to speak about how he created the EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. He's going to speak about the balance between online events and face-to-face -face events moving forward. And he's going to speak about some example of uh, people that have pivoted, reinvented themselves and what to do to thrive in the future. Uh, Vern Arnish, i so excited. How are you? Good. Very well, Eric. It's good to see you again. I uh, always enjoy speaking with you. Uh, your mentor to me, to many people that are reading, uh, whether it's scaling up, uh, whether mastering the Rockefeller habits, following your summit. Um, and you, you've done so many things in your life. Um, but how did you start being an entrepreneur? You, you were born like that? What, what happened? Well, I, I, you know, I grew up around it, Eric. So my grandparents on my dad's side both had their own companies. And then my dad, who literally was a rocket engineer at Martin Marietta, the Titan program, he and three buddies left. And one of the things that research has found is when an intact team leaves, say, a major company and launches, they can go much further faster. So my dad and his partners built a rocket ship of a company and then lost it all in the 73 recession. And he never really recovered from it. So, you know, what I do to help entrepreneurs is very missional. I don't want to have happened to any entrepreneur what happened to my dad and, and their company. And then I went on. I, I thought I was going to go into the nuclear Navy. And I got hired away by a, the, the late Dr. Fran Jabera, who had helped build Learjet and about 74 other companies. And he had launched the Center for Entrepreneurship. And he wanted me to join him to help build that. And the rest is history. Uh, launched that in 1982, a group called then ACE. Association of Collegiate Entrepreneurs in 1983, and then morphed that in 1987 into what we know today as EO, 14,000 members worldwide. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful of that because I'm also part of EO and uh, the forum experience is just amazing. Yeah. Now, in, in one of your uh, recent summit, uh, you were interviewing Mark Cuban, and, and Mark is also something to do with, with EO and the, the funding of EO. What was exactly the story? Yeah, well, you know, there as kind of a publicity stunt. I had tapped into John Nays, but John had written a major bestseller called Megatrends. And that back yes. then he was using what we know today as the internet, but it was the Lockheed databases. And I asked him through content analysis to identify the top 100 young entrepreneurs under the age of 30. And right at the very top was Steve Jobs. Number four on the list was actually Bill Gates. A lot of folks don't realize that Steve and Bill were exactly the same age, yet When we released that list, uh, Steve was almost $2 billion. Bill Gates was at a paltry $256 million. And the rest of the list then filled it out. And on that list was Mark Cuban. Mark had an IT services company in Dallas. And so I began to get that group together. And Mark began hanging out with us at our ACE and then YEO meetings. And the rest is history. We've stayed in touch over all these years. And from the beginning, you had this vision of having something worldwide or you thought, you know what, we're going to do it in this region and we'll, and we'll see how, how it grows. No, no. It, from the very beginning, the, the idea was that it would be global. And we were, we were global, the first organization in 36 months. Uh, idea in 83, 86, I led the first delegation of young entrepreneurs to mainland China. Uh, we held the event for Steve Jobs after he had been fired from Apple almost 1,200 entrepreneurs from all over the world, including Michael Dell and, and others were at that event. And so we went from idea to global uh, that quick. That's phenomenal. That reminds me of when I was a student, I was part of uh, ISEC, a uh, student uh, in economics and management. And I, you know, some of my friends, uh, we have common friends, they're, they're now in YPO, EO. It's this, there is this adrenaline of willing to change the world and, and developing business that is it's present in all of us. It's just amazing. Well, It was ISEC that was the model for ACE, Association of Collegiate Entrepreneurs. I actually was at, I think it was the 1981 ISEC conference that was held at Harvard. And it was one of the most amazing events I had ever attended. And the problem was the Harvard students left uh, Harvard with about an $80,000 bill. And so <laughs> Dean Archie F., this, the Dean of Students, was mad. And he said, all right, I want every student organization at Harvard to pull out of their national or international organization. So I went, when I launched then ACE, I went to Dean Epps and said, hey, could we host the very first conference at Harvard? And he said, heck no. And so <laughs> we went next door and held it at MIT and 
that's why I've had a great relationship with uh, MIT and the professors there uh, ever since. Yeah, and, and you did the, uh, the Bird of Giants program. Uh, did, yeah. So after I launched YEO, uh, YPO had a program at Harvard. I felt like, hey, we should have something similar. By the way, again, I did go back to Harvard and they said, heck no. So went next door again to MIT and they embraced us. And in fact, the book just came out. Um, I, I think I've got it some other place that just celebrated 50 years of entrepreneurship at MIT and read by, written by Dr. Ed Roberts, who was kind of the, my air cover uh, that kept us safe there at MIT. And it's really nice. They, they, feed, they have a couple of pages about the Birthing of Giants program and all of that is part of the legacy of MIT supporting entrepreneurs. It's amazing. And I remember Ken Morse, uh, I, I did the uh, entrepreneurship program at MIT, a uh, short program. But I remember having this, in, in all the business case, you had to read one, how to attend a cocktail. And I said, that must be a mistake. Yeah. And, and you know what? I'm going there. I it is. Just... No, Ken's. It's one of his, it's one of Ken's favorite uh, lectures. Yeah. yeah I and, it's, and it's, it's I a good one. It's very practical. Come, come earlier, 30 minutes earlier. And, and I did came uh, like come 20 minutes earlier. There's a lot of people. Ken gets on stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, hello. During this program, you're going to have to uh, demonstrate your entrepreneurial skills you have to be in group of five or six by tomorrow noon. And if you find yourself alone, that tells a lot about your entrepreneurial skills. Have a good night. Yeah. And everybody was like, oh my God. Well, so you, and you that know. was one of the very important pieces of research that Ed Roberts did, which is um, companies that have co-founders grow further faster than single, three do better than two, four do better than three, and five do better than four. And then he ran out of data points. So in that very first Birthing of Giants class was Brad Felt. And Brad went on to co-found Techstars. He's an MIT grad as well. And one of the rules within Techstars is you can't come into the program unless you have at least one co-founder. You can't come in as a solopreneur. Because wow. uh, the data is clear that co-founders uh, scale further faster than the, the solo entrepreneur. The yin and the yang together? Yeah. Well, and it's part of why I then launched uh, YEO, because that, that day that I hosted Steve Jobs, kind of, again, first public speech after being fired from Apple, we had a party then for the Ace 100 afterwards that evening, Bonaventure Hotel, LA. And I remember Steve just kind of standing in the corner by himself. And I realized that you know, my good friend Joe Mancuso's idea that it's okay to be independent, but no reason to be alone. And that mm -hmm. really became kind of the motivating factor to launch why EO now EO. And I think one of the things that uh, has been a legacy out of that is at least these 14,000 entrepreneurs that are in a forum are not alone, particularly they've had a great support group through this crisis and all the crises that uh, we've been through both personally and professionally and economically over all of these decades. And so that was really the impetus for uh, why EO or now EO. It's amazing. I, I have to tell you, it's still working. Um, three months, all right, two and a half months ago before the whole thing has started, I was actually when everything started, I was in my annual retreat with my forum mm. with the team of Describe Your Life in 10 Years yeah. and being uh, surrounded by friends like that. And that's uh, it gives also a different perspective. Now, I, I want to go into um, what you've been doing uh, the last weeks, which yeah. is absolutely impressive. Uh, and switch to uh, online events, the summit you're putting together, the presence that you have. And, and once again, thank you for taking the time to speaking with me today. Uh, you, we all with um, this podcast targeting uh, business owners in the meetings and event industry. So I would like to have your opinion on what is going to be in the future. Uh, is going to be everything online or are we going to go uh, to face to face? We're going to have an hybrid. How do you see the future of online events and face-to-face -face events together. Yeah, look, first, I don't think anybody can predict. Uh, we're, we're not looking out any further than a couple of weeks. Uh, if somebody says, hey, what are we doing in a month? I'm gonna say, I'll let you know in three weeks kind of thing. But uh, I think the best advice that we've got was you need to gather your own firsthand intel. Get out on the street, see what's going on, talk to people. So I, for instance, called John Laughlin. John manages our technology for our live summits. And he puts in all the virtual systems for major companies all over the world. So you can imagine he has been busy uh, right. as one of the big players in that particular space. And I said, John, what are you seeing? And he said, look, 
uh, the executives we're working with, even though everyone has to t talk about social distancing, board meetings, he's on six boards, I'm on three boards, the whole bit. It's like, we can't wait to get back together. I've got a physical board meeting next week in Detroit, and I'm flying in there. Because you can't, you can't substitute any way online for the real work that gets done after the meeting Agreed. when everybody is sitting there chatting. And so what he sees is things are coming back fourth quarter. Uh, we've got a big event in December. Uh, we can't get out of the hotel anyway right now. And he says, it looks like the mix is going to be about, you'll have about 60% of the audience that you thought you normally would, but they want to get together. The other 40% are going to beam in. And so this hybrid between live and virtual, and by the way, we've been streaming our summits for decades. And so it was really easy for us to have the technology in place instantly to be mm -hmm. able to move what we've been doing online uh, overnight. And, I, you know, I remember the first time that TV was broadcasting a football game. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought, oh, my God, nobody's going to come to the stadium anymore. Yeah. And at the contrary, when you see something, you want to be part of it. Yeah. Do you think that other venues or the conference are actually going to look at expanding their audience with a different offering for streaming? Well, I think, look, you're not going to change 200,000 years of human history just because we were locked down for two months. Right. And, you know, everyone, if, and my favorite quote of all time, the greatest lesson of history is we fail to learn from history. And coming out of the massive world wars, everyone thought things were going to be different. And they weren't, mm -hmm. you know, coming out of every crisis that we've seen in modern history, everyone thought, oh, this is going to fundamentally change the way we do things. It hasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we as human beings like to flock together. We like to get together. We like to connect. And as you said, we all thought the movie theaters were going to be out of business overnight when the Netflix and the others uh, came on board. And all they've done is expand. And as you saw, I don't know if it finally got finalized, but Amazon's been considering buying the AMC theater chain, mm -hmm. you know, which has just been going gangbusters uh, up until uh, this crisis. So now, how long is it going to take for us to get back to that? Uh, generally, I think it's going to be two years. It generally takes 24 months for this kind of stuff to make its way through, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. yeah. You know the story of how uh, Jeff Bezos uh, apparently was uh, at home and, and said, Alexa, buy me something from Whole Food. And Alexa said, buying Whole Food. And he said, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So a lot, of, a lot of legends there, but I got to tell you, my buddy, you know, we hosted him just uh, last week at our summit. Yeah. Uh, Brian DeMaine's book, Bezonomics. Bezonomics. I really, really do recommend people take a look at that. It digs into the real details around Amazon, how they've been able to do what they do in a very practical way. And there are ideas that we can adapt to our own companies. We've, we've adapted many of them ourselves. I also want to give the perspective is, Uh, even though they're the second largest company now in the United States, right behind Walmart, they still only have 1% global market share huh. uh, in, in retail. And if you look at Ikea, which uh, is the largest in the world in retailing furniture, and they've got 7%, just 7% after all these years, I, I think you're going to see Bezos is really the first trillionaire if he yep. stays in there. And it won't be hard to go from, if you go from 1% to 5%. Uh, so he's got a lot of runway out there, but it also means there's still 95% of it out there for the rest of us to get. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm bullish long-term as always. That's, yeah. And, and, and that's awesome. Great perspective. Because when, when you read and, and hear about it, you think that actually the whole market is taken, yeah. but the perspective just gave just amazing talking about action and what to do in the next three months, six months, 12 months, um, in, in scaling up, You're uh, attributing the, the success that the people are succeeding to two fact, two attributes. And as a Belgian immigrant to the U.S., I had to write it down to pronounce it because you said an insatiable desire to learn and an unquenchable bias for action. So learning and action. As business owners in the meetings and event industry right now, what are your advice? What should we be doing in the foreseeable future in the next six to 12 months? Well, you know, Eric, a lot of folks have talked about how fighter pilots, those that had the quicker OODA loop were the ones that, that survived, the others lost. That equivalent of that is our learn, decide, act cycle. And whoever can learn, decide, and act quickest 
And I, I particularly like General McChrystal, who we had on in our very first summit. And he said, look, what you've got to do is make 22 decisions every day and realize you're going to get two wrong. And then all you do is learn from that and, and keep moving. The worst thing is to only make two decisions every day. Mm. And so whoever's got the faster, what we call LDA loop, learn, decide, act. And at the heart of that is the oldest profession in the world. It's the key to winning wars and markets, and that is intelligence. Whoever has the best intel, firsthand intel wins. And that's why it's so critical for you to literally be talking to customers every day, to be talking to particularly your frontline employees who are in the trenches dealing with all of this stuff. You need that kind of firsthand intel very rapidly. And that's one of the reasons why when Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs took over Apple, he set up a war room and they met every single day. And I've shared many, many other stories of similar leaders that have moved to that same kind of a cadence. We even saw that when we hosted the head of people for Southwest Airlines. You know, no industry's probably been more devastated than the, than the airline industry as the event industry and hotel industry has. And the, Gary Kelly, their CEO, yeah. who typically did an Ask Gary town hall once a quarter, has been doing it twice a week. And so this picking up the pace of gathering firsthand intel, and then once you learn, decide and act, and then relearn again, because you're either winning or learning. There's no losing in these kind of things. So you just have to win or learn quicker than uh, everyone else uh, that's ahead. Of you you got to run faster than everyone else when you got a bear chasing you as the old uh, <laughs> idea goes. And so what we've done, uh, Eric, is we've really pivoted to, because uh, you know a lot of folks right now are being able to really scale up. Uh, we just saw this morning, it was released, the top 25 wealthiest people on the planet are a quarter trillion dollar wealthier through this, the rich are getting richer mm. uh, as a result. So there's some that are rapidly scaling up, others had to rapidly scale down. Either case, what we have to do is scale forward. And so we've been looking at essentially what we call the four Ps of scaling forward. You can go to scalingforward.com to see those, but it's basically getting focused around people, pivot, process, and price. And we've been going deep in those four areas with our clients and with our audiences. Okay. Can you maybe share two or three stories of the last month to, to inspire the business owners here? Well, we, we've had to live it ourselves. So, uh, you know, like the Gulf War launched CNN, clearly this crisis has launched 3D printing, localization, distance learning. Uh, a lot of industries are going to come out of this thing. Digitization, that's why all of those companies like Microsoft are at record market caps right now. Atlassian out of Australia, uh, who we're a big fan of, and I just bought another chunk of their stock. And so there's a lot of industries that are going to just propel right through this. And we think part of that is this opportunity to grab talent. And so, look, I don't want crisis to go to waste either. So we've launched a significant company right in the middle of this. And I was able to recruit a really top tech CEO, Josh Linkner, who honestly never would have been available except during this crisis. And so we're off to the races and the talent we've been able to attract to that new venture. That's why I'm going to Detroit next Thursday or Wednesday for our Thursday planning session mm -hmm. to begin to move that forward. So that's really on the talent or people side. On the pivot, there we think the real opportunity is, is to create a new category within your industry. And so everybody's talking about distance learning. We have really coined the term near learning or near training or near, and we just put whatever word after that, because uh, we really find that, look, first, we feel a lot closer to each other in this mode than if I'm on stage right. with three cameras shot, even with a, you know, something uh, like a TED Talk. And we also think near implies newness of the content. You know, the advice that we were given, you know, eight weeks ago changed three weeks later, changed again three weeks later. And we've got now a whole set of new principles moving forward over the next few months. And so near is about this feeling of being close, like mm -hmm. we see stars on the big screen. And near is about the freshness of the content. And so we think both of those are going to be critical in our industries moving forward. If we look then at process. Uh, here, we've got a real opportunity to bring digitization in to drive productivity. And 
the, the number that I obsessed on for years is revenue per employee. And the average revenue per employee of us mere mortal mid-market companies is only 126,000 uh, per employee. The Fortune 500 is almost 4X that. Mm-hmm. Yet they appear to be these big bloated bureaucratic messes, yet they're four times better at generating a dollar per employee than we are. And so it's a real opportunity to drive productivity and pr- through process. Right. And then last, pricing. That is your quickest way to power through this is being really clever about price. And if you come back to Amazon, it comes back to Intel. They, you know, a, a standard retailer has a price. And the only time they change it when they need to give it away, Amazon's changing price every hour based on the supply demand curve that they're looking at, much like what the airlines have done over the last several years uh, that drove such huge profitability before this crisis. So your cleverness in pricing, and we went to a good, better, best price seven weeks ago with our first summit. And it was amazing the psychology that we watched happen. Uh, People were willing to pay literally three times as much for getting something that they could have paid a third for. Uh, and, and the pricing strategy we had seven weeks ago, isn't the same pricing strategy we've got for this June 16 event we're doing with chief executive magazine. So anyway, those are the four P's we're living it ourselves as we pivoted our own business model. So people pivot process pricing. Uh, I I know there's a, it's very interesting point you're just mentioning. And, and and I know that, um, you love it. And we love the the work of uh, Robert Cialdini. Yeah. Uh, that maybe it's coming into the pricing. I know there's a lot of, of speakers listening and a lot of people yeah. uh, putting conference together and watching the price. What is your take on the price online versus face-to-face right now? Especially, well, not everybody's Vern Arnish and not everybody have uh, the access of your network. So h- how would you uh, go about it? And uh, as a business owner, what should I look at in terms of the pricing? Yeah, well, I think, Eric, we've already been through a lot of it. Uh, I think early on, it was about free. It was about reaching out and saying, all right, how can I help you making the list of key uh, relationships that you want to maintain and staying in touch with them over the seven weeks. There's a a major important relationship. I just reached out to her again this morning, offering help. And what was free eight weeks ago, now there's a cost Mm -hmm. today. And it's interesting. In some cases, uh, price signals quality, and we've been able to actually, in some space, raise our price. And, and as Herman Simon said, look, there's only two mistakes you make in pricing. You charge too much or you charge too little. And so <laughs> you just got to keep testing it and seeing what works and gathering yeah. the intel. Awesome. So I, again, thank you so much for your time for my last question. As I know you're an indie man everywhere. Um, if we, and that's a question I got from a, a good friend, uh, Jason Gagnard, who created the Mastermind Talk community, MMT, the fabulous community. And the question is, if we meet, when we meet in one year mm-hmm. with a bottle of champagne, what will we be celebrating? We're going to be celebrating my new company, uh, it'll, uh, it'll have a market cap of 40 million from wow. startup, uh, today on its way to a billion. And we'll have also changed the face of how business education is delivered here in the 21st century. So we're not going to let this again, crisis go to waste. That's absolutely Thank amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to seeing you face to face in the next conference. You got it. Thank you so much, Eric. I love how Vern is telling stories uh, and also learning how, you know, when he's talking about Steve and Bill in the room, as in Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, fascinating. And also his point about people, pivot, process and pricing. Very interesting. Great food for thought for us and how to apply it uh, in our businesses. Once again, if you have any question or if you are thinking about uh, somebody you want to hear in this podcast, reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn or join us on the private Facebook group by going to www.evenbusinessformula.com forward slash group. Thank you and talk soon.